Iraq, cradle of the ancient civilizations of Assyria, Babylon, Nineveh, and Ur. Steeped in history, it is one of the most significant regions of the world. Muslims conquered Iraq at the time of Umar bin al-Khattab. It became one of the most important Muslim lands from where large Islamic conquests began. Some of the greatest battles of Islam took place on its soil, like Qadisiyah and Madain. And it was home to many great cities, like Basra, Kufa and Baghdad. Two rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates, cross its land, making its wide plains some of the most fertile and productive lands in the world. Later, its distinctive geographic location at the head of the Gulf meant it was a vital route connecting Europe with the Indian Ocean. Its importance increased after the discovery of oil at the beginning of the 20th century. Iraq as a nation-state was established in 1921 after being part of the Uthmani Khilafah. The British and French occupied much of the Arab world in the First World War and sought to consolidate their power over the captured lands. In 1916, the Sykes-Picot Agreement, forged from this Anglo-French alliance, allocated what became Syria and Lebanon to the French and what became Iraq and Transjordan to the British. The League of Nations, a precursor to the United Nations and established by the Western victors of the war, quickly validated in international law British control over Iraq in the form of a British mandate. The Arabs for their part, were largely unaware of the colonial designs that the Anglo-French alliance had over their lands. Indeed, misguided though it may have been, their participation in the Arab revolt against Uthmani Khilafah in 1915 was a revolt to gain Arab independence and self-rule, not to exchange the rule from Istanbul for rule from Paris and London. The British encouraged the Arabs to revolt with a set of vague promises of independence that the Arabs believed, though the British had no intention of honouring these promises. However, the Anglo-French occupation of the Muslim lands did not sit well with the Arab masses. They had been comfortable under the rule of Islam for over a thousand years and had only recently fermented Arab nationalism and a desire for independence from the Uthmanis over the last 50 years. However, they were naive to capitalist colonial's foreign policy and expected the colonizers to keep their word. When they did not, there were rebellions and insurgencies throughout the Arab world, including Iraq. So it became necessary for the occupiers to set up an image of independence across the Arab world in order to avoid continued turmoil. Faisal ibn Hussein al Hashim was born in Mecca in 1885, son of Sharif Hussein, the governor of Mecca. He held administrative positions in the Uthmani political system and became a vociferous spokesman and supporter of Arab nationalism. He was well known to T.E. Lawrence, the British colonel who became famous as Lawrence of Arabia. Lawrence favoured and befriended Faisal and used him as one of the leaders of the Arab revolt for the British. Lawrence decided that the Arabs needed a leader from their own race. He chose Faisal. 
during the early colonial disturbances, Faisal sought at a Paris conference in 1920 to become king of a pan-Arab state. His request was rebuffed by the French and British, who had already agreed on the division of the Middle East into small Arab nations. Instead, he was made king of Syria. After a brief one-year period as king, he was removed by the French mandate, and the British eventually decided to use Faisal to subdue Iraq. Faisal's nomination was championed by Gertrude Bell, a chief advisor to Churchill who was based in Iraq and was a friend of Faisal's. At a Cairo conference in 1921, the British decided to name Faisal King of Iraq. King Faisal's coronation was strictly a British affair and he received his crown to the British anthem, God Save the King. In truth, his position was largely ceremonial and symbolic and Iraq continued to be ruled under the British mandate. The British had already started using oil to power their naval cruisers and battleships and there was already a recognition that oil was to become an important resource. It had been noted that there were pools of sludge around Iraq that would burst spontaneously into flame and it did not take long for the British to exploit this resource. In 1925 an oil deal was signed that underlined the British subjugation of Iraq. The agreement granted Iraq only token royalties from any future oil revenue, but the lion's share went to the British-dominated Turkish Petroleum Company. Indeed, the British intended to keep Iraq's oil to bolster its own industrialised economy. The British plan was that King Faisal would appear to the people to strive for the independence of Iraq from the British mandate. So the train brings the 49-year-old ruler of three million Arabs on his state visit to London. The two monarchs renewed the acquaintance which began during King Faisal's first visit 13 years ago. In 1932, this charade was rewarded with recognition by the League of Nations of Iraqi sovereignty. But in reality, independence was only granted on condition that the Iraqi government be bound to support British foreign policy in the region, allow Britain to retain its air, naval and land military bases and permit continued British domination over its oil resources. On his death, ruling was passed to his son, King Ghazi ibn Faisal. 